Good morning, and welcome to the MetroVision Idea Exchange, Clearing the Air, Climate Action Plans to Reduce GHG Pollution. My name is Kate Hale, and I'm an Assistant Planner here at the Denver Regional Council of Governments, or Dr. Cog. We are joined today by Angie Fife from ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, Kayla Betzold from the City of Wheat Ridge, Lisa Knobloch from the City of Longmont, and Lauren Tremblay from the City of Boulder. Here is our agenda for today. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the Dr. Cog website. Uh, there will be a brief survey that appears upon exiting the webinar, so please take a minute, um, consider taking a minute to respond to that. Um, I have a very short set of housekeeping items and announcements to run through um, before I turn the mic over to our speakers. Today we'll be using an application called Mentimeter for some live polling exercises. Um, to use this application, just go to menti.com on a browser window on your computer or smartphone and enter the code on the screen. Um, if you have a QR code reader on your phone, you can use that as well. Um, I'll give you all a moment to do that. And I do encourage you to have Mentimeter open throughout the webinar as we will be doing polling periodically throughout the presentations. Um, this is also the best way to submit questions for the panelists for the Q&A portion. Uh, to do that, just click the gray button that says ask a question on the Mentimeter screen. And you'll be able to do that at any point throughout the presentation. If you are unable to use Mentimeter for any reason, you may also use your GoToWebinar control panel to submit a question. Um, I will be monitoring the questions pane there as well, as you can see highlighted um, on the screen. I also wanted to quickly direct your attention to the location of the audio settings within the GoToWebinar control panel. If you are experiencing audio issues, you can let us know in the chat box and we'll do our best to help you troubleshoot. With the generous support of APA Colorado, AICP credit is in the approval process for attendees listening to this session live only. We will be sending out the event number for this webinar when it has been approved through APA. Okay, let's kick it off with our first poll. Um, you can again see the access information at the top of the screen there. Um, I'll give you all a moment to respond to your the option that best describes your title role. We'd like to get to know you all first. Good to see those answers rolling in. Looks like um, you all have the Mentimeter figured out. Again, if you have any questions, just pop them into the questions pane in the GoToWebinar control panel. I'm going to move on to the next question. How far along is your community in climate action planning? Okay, interesting little spread there. Um, quite a few in the learning phase and um, a good amount in leveling up. Perfect. I'd now like to introduce our first speaker. Angie Fife is the Executive Director of ICLE USA and a member of ICLE's Global Senior Management Team. Since 1990, ICLE has built and served a movement of local governments pursuing deep reductions in carbon emissions and tangible improvements in community sustainability and resilience. Angie, I'm going to hand off the controls to you and let you take it away. 
Great. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Kate, for the introduction. I don't need to introduce Ickley now. Um, thanks for doing that in, in my opening uh, there. I would like to, though, start by talking a little bit about the different types of planning instruments that local and regional governments use as they approach this topic. Um, I want to thank also the Dr. Cog staff who have been partnering up with us ethically for the last 18 months or so on a regional greenhouse gas inventory, which I will also speak about. And thank you to my co-panelists who are great local government champions and in doing incredible work in their communities. So this is a nice little graphic from the U.S. Department of Energy, this telescope of energy management, climate action plans, and sustainability plans. Local and regional governments approach their, their planning in one of these three ways, generally. The energy plan, of course, uh, identifying opportunities to transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy in both sources and uses in a community. A climate action plan is really grounded in a greenhouse gas emissions inventory. Increasingly, communities are looking at integrating climate adaptation along with climate mitigation to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Also, putting equity at the center and the focus of these climate action plans to ensure that no community is left behind uh, as climate action plans are developed. And communities often use sustainability plans, um, looking at environment, economy, and equity, or the three Ps, uh, people, planet, and prosperity, uh, as a, an instrument to uh, organize themselves and their community uh, advocates around um, these topics. In the ICLE network, just to give you a sense of, of how many folks are uh, working on these issues, um, here in the United States, we work with about 350 local and regional governments across the country. Um, we are tracking 115 communities that have set 100% renewable energy goals. So they have a goal to transition to 100% uh, renewables and away from fossil fuels. We're tracking 37 communities that have committed to divest their pensions from fossil fuels investments. 57 of our local government members have declared a climate emergency in their communities and 233 have set a target of being carbon neutral by mid-century. So a little bit about what we've been doing with Dr. Cog in the region. About 18 months ago, we had the opportunity to bring a number of local governments together, as well as uh, stakeholders in the region, utility companies, other nonprofit organizations, to talk about how we might take a regional approach to climate action. A couple of things that were on our mind as we approached that project. We wanted to understand how regional climate action could benefit individual municipalities within the region. How could climate actions be replicated uh, across municipalities so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, as individual municipalities? And how could the region sort of link arms and work together on issues that are best addressed at the regional level? So to start, we identified a boundary, and that boundary happened to be the Dr. Cog regional boundary, shown here on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, it's about 56% of the population in the state of Colorado, even though it only comprises about 5% of the land mass. Our first workshop was in October of 2019, and we had local governments attend and express the hazards, the natural hazards that they were concerned about and felt were increasing in intensity in the region because of climate change. You see those listed here on the left. And they also identified the expected impacts around public health and emergency services and so on uh, that would be uh, in, in need of attention in their community and in the region because of these increased climate change impacts. For the past 18 months though, since that uh, October workshop, we've really focused in on the mitigation side of the Climate Action Plan, starting with the greenhouse gas inventory. So Matthew Katz and Tom Harrod from the ICLE USA staff um, did all of the heavy lifting on this greenhouse gas emissions inventory. We chose 2018 
as the year in which we would identify what sort of activities were going on within the Dr. Cog boundary and how they contributed to regional greenhouse gas inventories. And so you can see from this pie chart that about 40% of the region's greenhouse gas emissions occur in the transportation and mobile sources sectors. So those are things like snowblowers and lawnmowers um, that use petroleum-based products. And about 45% of the emissions, the combined commercial energy and residential energy are coming from electricity, natural gas use um, to heat, cool, and power buildings in our region. As you know, the state of Colorado is also conducting a greenhouse gas inventory on a regular basis and developing a greenhouse gas roadmap for the state. So we wanted to do a bit of comparison between the Dr. Cog region and the state inventory to see how those compared. Um, we had to do a little bit of manipulation here because the state chose 2015 as the year in which they were measuring emissions, whereas um, here in the region, we looked at 2018 emissions. Um, so there was a little bit of work that we needed to do to shore those things up. This graphic is a little bit easier um, for folks to see how those comparisons shake out. So in the transportation and mobile sources sector, the Dr. Cog region accounts for 64% of the state's emissions. Again, we're about 56% of the population. So on a per capita basis, we're a bit higher per capita in terms of our emissions here in the region in the transportation sector than our, our uh, Colorado colleagues um, around the state and outside of the Dr. Cog region. However, in all other categories, we're slightly below a per capita uh, percentage for our greenhouse gas emissions within our region. The U.S. Community Protocol is the accounting protocol by which the regional inventory was developed. And the U.S. Community Protocol is the accounting standard that was developed by ICLEI and stakeholders um, back in the early 2000s. It is the industry standard for accounting for local greenhouse gas emissions in um, a, a local government, a city, a county, a town, or a regional um, group of governments. We simply draw a boundary around that geography and we count the activities that are happening within that boundary. The U.S. Community Protocol, while it's the industry standard, um, continues to evolve. This year we are excited to be rolling out the first um, 20 or so local greenhouse gas inventories which will be able to account for sequestration or removals that are occurring because of uh, land use changes, um, land use management, um, forestry and trees management. We do have a tool on our website. It's an open source tool. I encourage you to take a look at it. It's icleusa.org forward slash learn. Um, this is a partnership with the World Resources Institute, Global Forest Watch, and the Woodwell Climate Research Center. So again, um, a few things that we would love to get your input on as we um, go through our session today. Uh, how can regional climate action benefit individual communities within the region? What sorts of things do you think we as individual municipalities, local governments, cities and counties and towns should be working on together as a region? And how can we help to replicate these best practices across municipalities um, so that folks don't need to reinvent that wheel. So Kate, do I hand it back to you now for Mentimeter? Sure, yeah, um, you should see this question on your screen now. And um, once again, if you missed the introduction, at the top of the screen is the website to go to menti.com and use the code 9176770. Um, this is an open-ended question. Um, so um, go ahead and enter your responses there.
These are great. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for all this input. This is really good. All right. Thank you, guys. I'll, we have a couple more open-ended responses um, similar to this. So I'm going to go ahead and close this one and um, launch the next question. What climate action should the region work on together? All right, some great answers rolling in. Um, thanks all for the participation. This will be some interesting data to review. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close this question and move on to the next. What individual municipal actions are best replicated across municipalities in the region? I'm just gonna leave this one open for um, about 30 seconds. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close this one. Again, great participation. Um, appreciate everybody's responses. Next up to speak, we, um, thank you, Angie. <laughs> Next up to speak, we welcome Kayla Bessel. Kayla is the sustainability coordinator at the city of Wheat Ridge. Kayla, I'll hand off the controls to you and you can go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much to Dr. Cog for having me on this panel today. Uh, my name is Kayla, and I'm a sustainability coordinator with the city of Wheat Ridge. And I'm also the staff liaison to the Sustainable Wheat Ridge Resident Advisory Committee. You can see our, uh, our logo right here with a reference to our action plan, which I'll talk about in just a minute. My position is the first staff position within the city that's dedicated to sustainability. And since I've started with the city, I've focused on expanding sustainability programming in the community for both residents and businesses, applying for grants to supplement our work, implementing the Sustainable Neighborhoods Program, and making recommendations to council regarding future sustainability goals. This position is relatively new with me joining the city in February of 2020. And before there was a staff person, uh, there was a long history of urban agriculture in the city with Wheat Ridge's roots of being an agricultural hub in the Denver region at the turn of the 20th century. So the story of Wheat Ridge sustainability expansion and growth is a story of grassroots community engagement. And it's a unique example of how residents were able to provide input to city leaders to create lasting and impactful change within the city. I hope to bring an interesting perspective to this panel as the newest city that's partnering with ICLEI on a citywide greenhouse gas inventory, which we're starting this month. Um, although sustainability is a one-person department in Wheat Ridge right now, I've been able to rely on the support 
from my local and regional partners. There are a few reasons why we've been able to make such quick progress since sustainability really started in our city in 2017. One of those reasons is because of our highly talented and passionate Sustainable Wheat Ridge Resident Advisory Committee, who I work with very closely and they are an excellent resource to move projects forward. Another reason is that we are a relatively small city compared to our surrounding cities. So Wheat Ridge borders Denver, Arvada, Golden, and Lakewood, but only has a population of about 31,000. So we're facing and trying to address the same problems as some of our larger neighbors, although we can bring them into a smaller focus in Wheat Ridge and really move quickly on initiatives that are supported. So in this presentation, I'm going to walk you through the history of uh, sustainability in Wheat Ridge, uh, the progress we've made so far in our action plan goals, and uh, an innovative community engagement program that we've been using, and our vision for the future, which builds upon our work so far and takes sustainability to the next step. At the end, I'll provide a few resources for cities that may be in the same boat as Wheat Ridge, so a smaller city that's relatively new to greenhouse gas inventories and sustainability planning, and how you can get involved locally to plug into the great resources this area has to offer. So sustainability really got its official start in Wheat Ridge in 2017, but there really should be a section on this timeline that emphasizes the space before the timeline starts. Uh, there really was a grassroots movement going on in Wheat Ridge as the city was slowly changing and being influenced by Denver Metro to its east. So land use in the city was changing, traffic was changing, construction was happening, and all of these topics had sustainability woven into them. Residents began to bring thoughts and ideas to city council, and this led the then mayor to appointing an 11 person environmental sustainability committee that was tasked with providing recommendations to council in each of the six highlighted topic areas, energy efficiency and green building, renewable energy, transportation, solid waste and recycling, water and communications and engagement. So this committee reviewed uh, current environmental sustainability practices and engaged with city departments and community stakeholders using this information to create the action plan. The report was accepted by city council in June of 2018 and the committee was awarded its first year of funding in 2018 as well. There still was no staff person dedicated to sustainability, but the committee began a grassroots community engagement campaign to increase awareness of the sustainability action plan and new programs that were being offered to residents. The committee attended community events, began a partnership with Excel Energy, and even received two grants from Charge Ahead Colorado to purchase the city's first two electric vehicle charging stations. The committee was awarded an additional year of funding in 2019 to continue implementation, and the sustainability coordinator position was approved to begin in 2020. After I was onboarded last year, I became the staff liaison to the committee, and although we went to remote working a few weeks after I started, uh, we were able to make significant progress in each of the topic areas, as I had the opportunity to act as a conduit between the residents and the committee and staff, uh, city staff and leadership. In 2020, we focused on grant writing to supplement the funds that we had. Uh, we were awarded almost $12,000 from Longmont's Candade Foundation for 30 zero waste stations and training from Boulder's EcoCycle with the goal of transitioning the city's largest event, Carnation Festival, to zero waste in 2021. These supplies are also being used at other city events and community events in collaboration with our local nonprofit, Local Works. So this type of project allows myself and the sustainability committee members visibility at events throughout the city so we can continue to move sustainability and our program offerings into the everyday lives of our residents. We also applied for and received two grants from Excel Energy to cover the infrastructure costs related to the installation of the two previously grant funded EV charging stations. Our other major focus in 2020 was to expand our partnerships. So we started a citywide compost drop-off program with Scraps Mile High, partnered with the Regional Air Quality Council to award residents for switching to electric lawnmowers, and joined the Fresh Food Connect app to connect local growers with Family Tree, which is a nonprofit supplying fresh food to people experiencing homelessness and those in their domestic violence shelters. These partnerships, along with many more, allowed us to continue to expand the reach of our projects 
with limited staff and volunteer capacity. I wanted to give a quick overview of some aspects of the Sustainability Action Plan. The two graphs on top show the percentage of goals in each of the categories that are either in progress or have been completed since its acceptance in 2018, broken down by topic area. So the graph on the bottom shows the percentage of goals in each category that are policy, policy related. And it's interesting to me to see how much progress has been made in the action plan in just two years and also illustrates the need for continued progress on sustainability. At this point, focusing on policy changes within the city that may allow us to continue to expand our programming. Our council has already made code updates that have improved access to urban agriculture in the city. And that one would fall under the um, energy efficiency and green building, which is shown here in blue. I wanted to take a minute to highlight the new sustainable neighborhoods program in Wheat Ridge. So this program was started uh, by the city of Lakewood and it's expanded to the cities of Denver, Fort Collins with Reet Ridge being the fourth municipality in the network. This program is intended to encourage direct citizen action towards sustainability in five categories, energy, air, water, land, and people, uh, which match the topic areas outlined in our action plan. This program also addresses our, uh, the Wheat Ridge uh, strategic plan goal of facilitating neighbor to neighbor relations. This program is beneficial to our city as it creates a framework for neighbors to develop an action plan to enhance the long-term character, livability and sustainability of their own specific neighborhood, leading to an overall increase in neighborhood connections and resiliency within our city. Through the program, neighbors work together to create and manage sustainability projects such as neighborhood cleanups, energy efficiency targets, and EV workshops, and city staff provide resources and guidance to assist neighbors in accomplishing their project goals. There are many types of projects that neighborhoods uh, can complete with social distancing, and the program has allowed both Wheat Ridge and the other cities in the network to continue to make progress towards sustainability goals and resident cohesion uh, despite the pandemic this year. The program also uh, serves as a tool for engagement and resident interest in other city-led neighborhood programs. So throughout the implementation process uh, in Wheat Ridge, I worked with one of our senior neighborhood planners to align our, um, our communication techniques and our outreach strategies to ensure that we are both working congruently uh, to support other city-led neighborhood programs, which ultimately you know, resulted in, in a higher success rate of both of our programs. The Sustainable Neighborhoods Program is resident-led, which differentiates it from other city programs and enables individuals to creatively work together to develop strategies to solve problems in their own neighborhoods. By implementing a program with this type of framework, we're allowing our residents to lead one another, not only with the Sustainable Neighborhoods Program, but in making positive change within our city. This program inherently creates a structure for individuals to become engaged and active within our city government, local organizations, businesses, and with other residents, which can result in a network of really engaged leaders in our community. We have two neighborhoods currently enrolled in the program, and both groups are working on neighborhood organized trash hauling projects, which is a multifaceted challenge that a lot of local municipalities are facing in this area right now. Um, so we're really excited about that, and we are continuing to increase uh, the equity lens of this program through the people category um, and focusing on expanding to uh, the both the current neighborhoods and the new neighborhoods and their programming to serve uh, under underserved areas of Wheat Ridge. We're also focusing on expanding to new housing types such as multifamily residences as the program expands its reach within our city. Our vision for 2021 is to enhance sustainability in Wheat Ridge through strategic program offerings and expansion of our current outreach demographics and a focus on projects that will lead, uh, yield long-term results. So we're focusing on becoming an educated, analytical, and data-driven city by partnering with ICLE uh, for a citywide greenhouse gas inventory. By completing this kind of analysis, the city will have baseline measurements for carbon emissions from all of our major sectors, electricity, buildings, transportation, and waste. The inventory will result in an accurate calculation of aggregate emissions data, and the data will be uh, utilized to create baseline metrics and inform future climate and sustainability goals. 
As cities in the region uh, move towards collaborative climate goals, Wheat Ridge is now joining the conversation by accessing a reliable source of baseline metrics. Another major focus in 2021 is on our business community. So we realize that current circumstances have put a burden on businesses to continue their operations. And um, we saw an opportunity here to support local businesses while furthering our sustainability goals. So through the implementation of a sustainable business grant program, we'll provide matching funds to Wheat Ridge businesses that are interested in implementing strategies to lower costs and reduce emissions. We are currently reviewing the goals that are outlined in the Sustainability Action Plan from 2017, and we'll be looking into updating the plan in 2021. I'm also putting together policy recommendations for council to inform updates to the city's uh, strategic plan. As many of our action plan goals relate to policy, we are thankful to have a council that supports our work and is open to policy suggestions that can pave the way for both city and regional collaboration on sustainability planning in the future. We're also forming an equity task force in Wheat Ridge, and I'll be working with this group to review the sustainability plan and current programming to increase equity in all of our programs in the future. And as I mentioned, we are transitioning our city events and community events to zero waste um, to just increase our, our visibility and our presence in the community and reduce waste. So overall, um, it's not so terrifying to get started as a newer city with sustainability. Um, I saw on the, the poll that a lot of, it sounds like a lot of you are just getting started. Um, so I'm glad that I can share kind of my perspective and experience with that. Um, I found and we found in Wheat Ridge that resident and community buy-in um, and high levels of engagement early on can provide visibility to the sustainability plan, uh, goals, and initiatives, and can pave the way for projects like climate action planning and policy change in the future. I've acted as a conduit between the residents and the committee and city staff and leadership to provide a clear flow of information and to be sure that we're all involved with the decision-making process. One of the most impactful things that uh, for us is really our partnerships that we've developed. If you're a city where there's not a lot of resident or staff or leadership capacity, bringing in the experts can really expand the reach of the programming and build relationships for that continued collaboration in the future. We definitely have gaps um, in Wheat Ridge where we need to focus our efforts in the future, not only made clear by the percentages in the action plan graphs, but also because of our, you know, our limited staff and volunteer capacity. I have found that relying on regional groups and uh, partners has made my work uh, much more efficient. A smaller city like Wheat Ridge, um, uh, as a smaller city, we're hoping to learn from, you know, the long months of the world and the boulders of the world through this regional collaboration and by standardizing as much as we can regionally so that we can focus our efforts together on renewable energy and greenhouse gas reduction goals. Um, there are a few groups that I wanted to share as a resource for all of you. First, we have a Jefferson County Sustainability Directors Group that meets quarterly to talk about what each of the cities in Jefferson County are focusing on and how we can all collaborate. And then there's also a Regional Sustainability Directors Meeting that is a much larger group. This group also meets quarterly. We share updates um, and we strategize how you know, large and small cities can work together as a collective voice towards uh, larger regional goals. So if you would like to join either one of these groups, uh, please reach out to me. And thank you for uh, attending the webinar today. And also please reach out to me if you'd like to continue the conversation, um, you know, about collaboration or um, program participation. And I think because I am so early on in the process of sustainability, my questions are, are mostly to really kind of gauge where everyone is at with um, community, resident, um, business community engagement, and kind of how things have um, been going in 2020 because I know it's been a really challenging year and so I think it's you know when we're talking about regional um, regional collaboration I think it's important to kind of recognize where we're all at and how we can support each other um, with the challenges that we've had throughout this year and kind of looking into how to recover from this in 2021 and in the future. Yeah so it's looking like as the results come in here, and thank you to everyone who is participating. It's looking like, you know, 
quite a bit, quite a few of you have struggled with, you know, engagement in 2020. And I think that that's something that we have kind of all, it's a common thread. It's something that I've been hearing a lot, you know, as I meet with other cities in this region um, and the larger Front Range uh, region. And so something, you know, the program that really did help us with that was the Sustainable Neighborhoods Program. Um, we launched the program in 2020 during the pandemic, which was challenging, but it really is something where our residents were looking, I think, for something, for an opportunity to connect and for, you know, a pathway to continue to um, build that community interaction and kind of work on projects with their neighbors. So that is definitely something that helped us, but I think we're all kind of, in the same boat here. So the next question is, what are your largest barriers to increasing program participation? And I'm not sure if everyone can see the answers, but the options are uh, funding, support from leadership, marketing, communication. So do people know about the programs? Um, interest, uh, uh, I can barely read this, <laughs> Comp uh, competing priorities. So, you know, all of us just having so much going on all the time and uh, the expertise, so both on the policy side and the technical side. And I'm sure there's a lot of other answers too that we can add to this. Um, but yeah, just wanted to kind of get get an idea, especially since so many, so many of you expressed that you kind of are, are early on, you're learning about climate action planning, kind of similar to where Wheat Ridge is at. So it's interesting just to kind of, kind of get a breakdown here of of um, where our program participation lies and kind of how we can maybe look together at, you know, as a regional community at some of these barriers. Thank you, I appreciate it. Give you a few more seconds here. Yeah, it seems like a really great kind of spread of different different ideas here and well thank you I appreciate all the feedback and the um the question answers you know I think it's good to kind of get get an idea of where everyone else is at with engagement and program um, participation and planning so again I don't know if my last slide is on here but again feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to be added to any of the um, sustainability directors either the Jefferson County group or the regional group, or if you want to continue the conversation on about anything I talked about or have any ideas or thoughts. And thank you again to Dr. Cobb. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you for your presentation and your um, questions. Um, I just a quick reminder that you may also submit questions for the panelists. We'll be doing a, a Q&A section at the end of the presentation. Um, you can do that at any point by clicking the gray button that says ask a question on Mentimeter the same application that you're using um, for the polling exercises. Uh, and you may also use the questions pane in GoToWebinar if you are not using Mentimeter. Now, please welcome Lisa Knobloch, uh, the Sustainability Program Manager at the City of Longmont. Lisa, I'm passing the controls off to you now. Great, thank you so much, everyone. I'm Lisa Knobloch, the Sustainability Program Manager for the City of Longmont, and I really appreciate you be part of this panel. Uh, and it looks like, um, Kate, hopefully my slides will pop up there. Oh, maybe I can advance them from here. There we go, great. Uh, and I just wanted to say uh, thank you to Kayla for that great presentation. I'm I'm so, excited and applaud the work of Wheatridge. You guys have done a, a tremendous amount. It's very impressive uh, in, in the amount of time that you have been there. Uh, and it, I'm excited to see the work that you all continue to do and, and just wanna echo the resources that Kayla brought up at the, at the end. Um, just highlighting that I've also found a lot of the, the resources, especially around the regional directors network to be really useful in getting our program uh, off the ground as well. So for some of those smaller communities that are just getting going and even for some of the, the larger communities as an opportunity to network and collaborate. Oops. Sorry, there's a bit of a lag here that I just need to get used to. Uh, and before I get into my presentation, uh, I just wanna give a shout out to um, my team, Bernice Garcia-Tillas, Francie Jaffe, Astrid Villalobos-Chavez, 
and Acha Nusrat for the amazing work that they do. Uh, the sustainability program really wouldn't be where it is today without them. And I also started as, as a one person program similar to Kayla and, and I'm excited to be now a few years in with a thriving team and a thriving program with committed sustainability partners really across the organization and the community. And I'm uh, gonna run through a brief uh, history of the sustainability program and our sustainability plan and the recent development of our climate action recommendations report uh, from our climate action task force and just transition plan committee. So in 2015, a passionate group of residents, uh, similarly to Wheat Ridge, really convinced our, our city council to bring back sustainability work and complete the city's first sustainability plan. There had been a sustainability coordinator uh, in the past that was working on a sustainability plan that was largely focused on internal operations, uh, but a lot of that got put on hold in, in 2010 and really just kind of sat for a long time. There was some work that was still done internally with the folks that were able to move that forward. Uh, but then this community group really came in 2015 and pushed the council to focus again on sustainability. And so I was hired in, in early 2016, initially as attempt to do that work. And through the planning and community engagement process to develop the, the sustainability plan, we developed Longmont Sustainability Vision which is an engaged community that promotes environmental stewardship, economic vitality, and social equity to create a sustainable and thriving future for all. And that's really been the guidepost of our program ever since. During the development of the sustainability plan, I met with several community groups across the, across the city to really understand what were the needs and priorities from the community and really equity issues such as access to services, resources and amenities, as well as the affordability of housing and utilities emerge as key priorities. And in that process, I also wanted to identify what work was being done currently in the community that the sustainability plan could really help support and advance. And I think that approach and that work has been really critical in building broad relationships within the community and across our organization as well and establishing equity as a foundational component of the sustainability program. And we now work really closely with our community services department, which has been a huge asset to our program and has helped our program be as successful as it is. We identified 10 topic areas, which are listed here. Uh, each, topic areas, each topic area has targets, objectives, strategies, and timelines uh, that were really focused on what the city could achieve in a 10-year time frame, and that was really the direction that came up from our city council at the time that they really wanted to see things that were realistically achievable. Uh, the plan was completed and adopted by a city council at the end of 2016 and was really closely aligned with the city's comprehensive plan known as Envision Longmont, which laid out guiding principles and policies with the core tenets of sustainability and resilience. Luckily, when we finished that plan, our city council recognized that it really did require a staff person to make sure that the plan was implemented. And so I was hired on full time to manage the implementation of the sustainability plan and build the, the city sustainability program. One of the strategies that was in the sustainability plan was to develop the city's first greenhouse gas inventory. Uh, so this was done in 2017 using 2016 data in which we also established our greenhouse gas reduction targets and priority strategies to help us achieve those targets. And the criteria that we used to prioritize those strategies included co-benefits that tied back to those equity priorities that the community identified during the planning process such as impacts on public health and affordability, access to resources and benefits from sustainability, in addition to just greenhouse gas reduction potential. And one of the top strategies that emerged was the development of a just transition plan, which I'll get into um, more shortly. The inventory just went through its first uh, update in 2020 with 2019 data, and this is just an overview of uh, our 2019 emissions, showing electricity as the primary contributor along with natural gas and on-road transportation. We've made quite a bit of progress in the renewable energy sector, um, thanks to our uh, the cooperative that we own with the Loveland, Fort Collins, and Estes Park communities with Platte River Power Authority. And we're now at about um, just over 50% renewable energy, which is pretty exciting. 
And this information has been incredibly helpful for us to identify and prioritize um, local action to address climate change, as well as those areas where we really need to work on a regional level, transportation being one of those primary areas. In 2018, the city passed a resolution to transition to 100% uh, renewable energy. And it did call for considering the needs of low income residents. And with that, we kicked off the just transition process to ensure that our transition didn't adversely or doesn't adversely affect disproportionately impacted members of our community. And the purpose of a just transition more broadly is to create inclusive engagement, inclusive recommendations, and inclusive practices that apply to climate action, community health, basic needs, and job creation. And this inclusive engagement piece uh, is really critical in identifying strategies that meet our greenhouse gas goals without creating unintended consequences. Francie Jaffe, who at the time was an intern and is now our water conservation and sustainability specialist who's been leading this project, research just transition plans and incorporating equity into climate action and really tried to get as much information as possible about how we could go through this process and put together this process that's outlined here to develop the just transition plan. And we were really just at the last stage of this process here of forming a recommendations committee uh, when the city passed a climate emergency resolution and calling for the convening of a climate action task force to develop a report with recommendations that Longmont could implement to uh, more rapidly address climate change. And since that coincided with our timeline to establish the Just Transition Plan Committee, that created an opportunity for us to expand the focus of the Just Trans Transition Plan Committee beyond energy to climate action more broadly. So we ended up running those two groups concurrently with the Climate Action Task Force uh, focusing on developing recommendations specific to climate action and the Just Transition Plan Committee providing feedback to the Climate Action Task Force as well as the, developing their own recommendations to ensure that all climate action centers equity in process and outcomes by partnering with those frontline communities and determining equitable solutions. The Climate Action Task Force developed recommendations in these six primary areas uh, on the outer side of this ring uh, with equity as a, as a central focus. They did focus largely on mitigation, uh, but they did also develop recommendations in, in adaptation and resiliency because we know that impacts are here and they're likely to continue to get worse. And we really wanna make sure that we're preparing our community for that as much as possible. We also know that some members of our community are and are more likely to continue to suffer the impacts of climate change more than others, and that those disparities are rooted in historical injustices from systemic oppression. And without addressing that in climate action work, we risk perpetuating inequities and potentially causing further harm through impacts on affordability and livability. So we really need to be aware of and understand who reaps the benefits and who bears the burdens of change in our community. And the work of the Just Transition Plan Committee looked at that by developing their own definition of equitable climate action, as well as an equity lens to evaluate climate action task force recommendations. We also held one joint meeting between the two groups to do a more in-depth anal equity analysis of some of the climate action task force recommendations. The Just Transition Plan Committee developed uh, equity assessment recommendations, which were specific to climate action, as well as overarching recommendations that can really be applied to any city planning process. And those were included in the Climate Action Recommendations Report, which is um, available on our website. I'm also happy to share that with anyone for those folks that wanna see uh, the, that entire report that contains the Climate Action Task Force recommendations along with the Just Transition Plan Committee recommendations. And they've since adapted those recommendations to into an equity checklist that will be used in the implementation of climate action recommendations. And we're really just getting into that process now. So that's going to be a work in progress, uh, but we're, we're looking forward to, as we get into, into implementation, 
utilizing that checklist um, and continuing forward with integrating equity into climate action. And of course, we know that we can't do this work alone and we've built really strong relationships with the business community, uh, as well as launching neighborhood programs, um, similar to the sustainable neighborhood um, program that Kayla was talking about, uh, to really engage residents in sustainability and climate action work and build capacity on, on the neighborhood level as well as working with regional state and national groups such as the colorado communities for climate action which has really helped us advance um, support for climate action locally uh, especially in areas like transportation again which really need to have need to happen on coordinated efforts on on a regional scale and i really want to highlight here the sustainable business program um, this program is led by our economic sustainability specialist bernice garcia tiaz it's a bilingual program that's focused on supporting businesses and engaged in sustainable practices really focused on the triple bottom line not just on the environmental component of sustainability and bernice has done an incredible job building that program that now serves as a model and she serves as a mentor for other communities that are particularly interested in bringing the equity component into sustainable business programs and ultimately we really want to move um, uh, on a on a systems level from an extractive economy to a regenerative one and I just want to leave you with this slide that I really like from the Climate Justice Alliance framework, which I think really encapsulates the shift to a society that values the health and well being of all of our communities as well as the planet that sustains us. So, I just have a couple of questions for you as well. I'm curious, first of all, who currently has? Uh, greenhouse gas reduction goals? And if so, um, what are they? So if you'll notice uh, on the slide that I had our greenhouse gas targets, we have an unusual goal of 66% uh, um, by 2030, which is, which is a little unusual. It really goes back to our direction from our city council of identifying strategies that were realistic and achievable. So we first really set out on that process, again, with those uh, strategies that had those co-benefits that I talked about and then modeling that to identify what we felt like we could achieve by 2030 and i think really the next step of our process is going to be increasing those targets as well so it's really helpful to see all of the other ways that folks have have approached their defining their greenhouse gas reduction goals and what are those common threads this is great thank you all for sharing that well i think we'll give it just another second and then we'll move to the next question whenever you're ready There's still some things coming in, or do I move that? Oh, sorry. Great, there we go. And then the next question is, uh, have you worked to incorporate equity into climate action planning? And the choices are, yes, it's a major focus, a yes, but we need more guidance. No, um, not yet, but planning to or not. Let's give another minute, see if anyone else wants to check in. Great. Really, it's exciting to see folks that have been doing that or that are planning to. Um, and definitely, you know, we're we're more than we're more than happy to to talk further with folks that are interested in any of the information that I've shared with folks today on how we've gone about that. And also acknowledging that we're we're still in 
in a lot of the beginning stages of, of figuring out how to best um, do that as well. But we are definitely happy to share our information and lessons learned. Thank Great. you, Lisa. Yeah, thank you all so much. All right, um, last but not least, we welcome Lauren Tremblay, a sustainability analyst at the city of Boulder. There's Lisa's contact information. Um, give you a second to jot it down. Great. Hello, everyone. It's great to be with you all today. My name is Lauren. I'm a sustainability analyst with the city of Boulder, and I'm excited to be talking to you all about the evolution of climate action in Boulder, really moving to a shift uh, to systems level change. And that's something that Lisa did a really good job of setting up kind of at the end of her slides, um, really talking about that shift. And it's great to be on this panel today with Lisa, Kayla, and Angie, and um, really excited to talk, talk, talk to you all today. Um, so let me make sure I can actually share the slides here. There we go. So Boulder launched its first formal climate action efforts in 2002, where city council reaffirmed their commitment to environmental sustainability as one of the four major council goals. And since that time, the city has been really at the forefront of innovation and working to reduce climate impacts, adopting the climate action plan tax, the country's first voter approved tax dedicated to addressing climate change, developing a national model for delivering energy efficiency services, and enacting one of the country's more stringent energy codes for buildings and, and much more. So the cap tax that was adopted in 2007, the Climate Action Plan tax, was designed to generate revenue at the time to meet the Kyoto Protocol greenhouse gas emissions targets, which were a 7% reduction from 1990 levels by 2012. And since then, obviously, the city has set much broader, more aggressive goals most recently with the release of our climate commitment, which came out at the end of 2016, which sought to achieve an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from a 2005 baseline by 2050, um, to have 100% renewable energy by 2030, uh, to divert 85% of our waste by 2025. So at the time we felt those goals and targets were aggressive and difficult to achieve um, but just two years later, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, came out with their special report, which really revealed that we needed to do much more, much faster to really avoid catastrophic levels of warming. And this really sparked the city of Boulder to declare a climate emergency in mid-2019 and to launch our climate mobilization action plan efforts, really recognizing that addressing climate change will require immediate system scale action to create an equitable future and to really rapidly reduce emissions to move towards techn technological innovation and really address climate change. So as you can see in the graph here, um, while we're tracking progress towards our climate target of an 80% emissions reduction by 2050, it shows that we're on track. Um, we even exceeded our 2020 target by 6% already in 2019. Um, but the reality is that, that we learned recently with the IPCC report is that this is not enough. Um, so when you look at the red line, if we're really aiming to keep global temperature rise to under 1.5 degrees of warming, that would really move our 2050 goal closer to 2030 and really require an even larger reduction effort within that timeline. But at the same time, we also recognize that it's not just about moving a number and moving a year, it's really about reevaluating how we measure success and how we engage in climate action. And that's really been the core focus of our climate mobilization action plan efforts this past year. So with the release of the IPCC report, we really uh, highlighted a, a couple of key points that were really um, kind of opened our eyes. So one of those is really that climate change is accelerating and we have fewer than 10 years to really keep additional global warming temperature rise below 1.5 degrees of warming. We also recognize through this report that emissions reduction alone will not be enough. We must dramatically increase our levels of carbon sequestration so that we can net out the residual emissions and really achieve net zero within the near future. 
and that communities really need to start preparing now for significant climate impacts that are soon to come. So, sorry, again. so after 20 years of climate action, and despite having an ambitious uh, climate action plan, we really recognized our approach was insufficient to respond to the rapidly escalating changing climate. And with this realization came a few new insights that I was hoping to share with you all today. And one of those is that we really need to move from individual change to systems level change. Our society is built upon a flawed system of structures and systems that must be changed and that are not gonna be significantly shifted or impacted by isolated individual choices or even individual communities. By re redesigning systems, we really will require foundational change that must be driven by laws and policies and reinforced by market mechanisms and cultural norms. So climate change itself is really not the problem, but rather a symptom of, of flawed systems. So we can't work as an island either and really hope that if we're able to solely achieve significant process, we'll inspire others to follow suit. And uh, until the whole world is revolutionized, it's just really not working that way. We need to instead work outside of our boundaries with other cities, with partners, with organizations to leverage economies of scale and affect policy change to levels that are required. We also really need to recognize the intersectionality of solutions and drive for initiatives that will mitigate emissions while also helping us adapt to a changing climate. So properly designed climate actions can actually move us away from fossil fuels while also really improving racial, gender, and economic equity and making us more resilient against the changing climate. So when you look at something like energy efficiency assistance to low income communities, that can really improve health and provide equitable solutions to energy insecurity. Similarly, tree planting programs not only reduce energy needs for cooling, but they also have proven to improve mental health, community trust, and generally improve the aesthetics of the community and overall. So while past climate actions have also really focused exclusively on emissions reduction, the rapid escalation of climate change and its many social impacts require that climate action now incorporate both equity and social justice as well as resilience as fundamental design criteria in all our proposed actions. So climate change as a risk multiplier really magnifies the impacts of extreme weather, poor air quality, economic instability, and more. And in all of these instances, burdened communities are really the most vulnerable and will continue to suffer the greatest under the climate crisis if um, this uncertainty continues to persist. And that's something that really needs to be at the foundation of our climate action planning into the future. So really looking at the characteristics of what systems level change means, it means that we need to kind of turn the conventional system on its head and really make it so that the right choice is the only choice or the easiest choice. So there's kind of a stigma that by choosing to do the thing that's best for the environment, the more sustainable option, we kind of have to sacrifice something or go through a hurdle in the way that systems are currently designed. And we really need to shift that system so that the better thing to do for our environment and our global community is really the easiest, most cost efficient, best choice to make. And this has to apply to everyone. The rules really have to change and the costs need to be shared across sectors and time. And the implications of this are really that actions must be bigger than our organization, bigger than our boundaries, replicable, and they need to occur as soon as possible. So this is really showing the um, core pillars of our climate mobilization and action plan. Again, equity and resilience are really at the core of the work that we're doing. And around those, we're focusing on five uh, major systems that we're looking to affect through our climate plans. The energy systems, regenerative ecosystems, really looking at regenerating our lands and engaging in large-scale large carbon sequestration, um, addressing land use, our financial systems really moving money towards a just and equitable community and future and addressing a circular materials economies that we're reducing and uh, recycling while also kind of creating a more uh, systems level change within how we use and consume within our society.
So this leads us to another conversation that we've really had um, around how we need to change the way that we measure success. So while greenhouse gas emissions have been and will continue to be an important measure in addressing climate change, they're not the only measure and we really need to incorporate indicators that evaluate progress in realms of equity, resilience and economic vitality if we're to develop systems that are really successful into the future. And kind of like what you mentioned before, because solutions really are intersectional, the programs that reduce emissions also have net benefits of things like improving air quality and community health. So we need to really ensure that we're measuring success in a way that draws out those local benefits while also provoking large scale system wide change. And this is an example of the most recent kind of output from a 2019 greenhouse gas inventory. So the city of Boulder has been conducting inventories for many years now, which has enabled us to track the largest sources of emissions in our community and really measure progress over time. And it's been very helpful for our community in many ways over the years. So in 2005, which is the baseline year of our inventory, we saw that electricity made up 55% of our total emissions at over a million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So at that time, we prioritized energy related efforts with energy supply assuming a significant focus in our climate work. And this resulted in strong advocacy at the state level for renewable energy, working with homes and businesses on energy efficiency, and ultimately led to a community-based decision to municipalize our energy supply, which has now led to a strong partnership with our utility provider to work on more renewable solutions. So after decades of community-led activism to build an energy future that's better for our planet and community, We've reduced our emissions associated with our electricity supply by 36%, now standing at about 650,000 metric tons in 2019. So the city's still driving for more in that area, pushing for 100% renewable electricity supply by 2030. And in monitoring progress in the electricity sector, we've also noted that as we make more advancement in that area, um, the emissions associated with our natural gas and heating our buildings as well as our transportation systems becomes a much more significant piece of our total emissions pie and those are areas we need to be addressing as well as electricity so that we're constantly driving down our emissions through uh, pushing for a renewable electricity grid and electrifying our buildings our vehicles and really driving down vehicle miles traveled altogether within our community another thing though that we really wanted to um, highlight here is that while we recognize uh, the impact that we've had through monitoring our emissions, we've also uh, we also recognize that the boundary at which we calculate emissions in the past doesn't really incorporate other transboundary activities that have a lot of impact. So things like food choice, consumption behaviors aren't fully captured in the way that we conduct our inventory. So when you look at an average household, these emissions um, that we do calculate largely scope one and scope two emissions represent only about 40 to 50 percent of a household's total emissions footprint. So our inventory doesn't really capture emissions associated with things like food choice and purchasing behavior. And that's something that we need to pay attention to going forward into the future. So we're now looking to incorporate consumption based emissions as well as the carbon sequestration of our forests and trees into our inventory process in the future so that we can uh, establish a motivation to really manage what we measure and incorporate those tracking mechanisms into the future. So as cities really need to accelerate the development cycle of new approaches in each of these major three emission sources, so addressing scope one, two, and three emissions. And Boulder, as well as other well-resourced communities can play a really important role in leading the innovation around these new approaches. So this cycle uh, provides the basis for changing the underlying policies and laws that will provide the appropriate incentives for accelerating their adoption. The City of Boulder works alongside its participant communities in bodies such as CC4CA, which is Colorado Communities for Climate Action. And this is an example for the sort of innovation to policy pathway. So many of the significant policy initiatives that CC4CA has helped champion adoption for at the state level have really grown out of these early stage innovations and have been developed um, through local cities, counties, and other early innovators.
And um, kind of as has been mentioned throughout all of these presentations, you know, we really recognize the that partnerships are really the key to success. So Boulder, alongside other cities, have been leaders in efforts to develop state level climate and energy policy. And we really need to engage more with partners in these collective pathways to really achieve the level of policy and market change that is needed into the future. And both staff and community members within the city of Boulder are active in a wide range of national and even international efforts that are now increasingly focused on how to change the underlying structures that are responsible for climate change and other social and environmental challenges. So this active and recognized leadership role at multiple scales gives Boulder the unique potential to develop, test, and help disseminate effective strategies for intersectional systems change solutions uh, to move from kind of the local to a global scale. And that leads me to one of the questions I have for you all is uh, what key metrics or indicators should cities be measuring to track success in climate action? Great, these are some great responses here. Awesome, we can give these another 10 seconds, I guess, and then hand it back over to Kate, but these are really great guys, thank you. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate that. That's really helpful okay, to have the level of engagement. Yeah. Um, thank you, Lauren, for your presentation and uh, your question. Great responses. Um, thanks to all of our wonderful panelists this morning, Angie, Kayla, and Lisa. We have about 15 minutes for a Q&A before we wrap up at noon. Um, please continue to submit your questions. Um, using the Mentimeter app. Uh, the information is on the screen, menti.com, enter the code displayed there. Uh, the little button looks like this. Um, if you are not using Mentimeter, you may also do so through our um, GoToWebinar questions pane here. Um, so uh, we have Brad Calvert um, will be um, monitoring our Q&A sec section, so um, I'm going to pass the mic off to him now. Uh, thanks, Kate. Uh, and again, thanks everybody, all of our panelists for, for spending time with us today, and, and special thanks for the audience. I know everyone has uh, screen fatigue, uh, oh. so to, to see 70 folks join this call at one point in time suggests how important this issue is to communities and professionals uh, around the region. So again, thanks everybody for, for the time. Uh, today, as, as Kate mentioned, we got about maybe 15 minutes or so. Uh, we collected questions uh, not only through today's conversation, but during uh, registration as well. So I have all sorts of different ways that questions ha have come in. So just, just know I'm going to take sort of moderator's prerogative and try to sort of package them in, in a way that makes sense. Uh, I'm always, as a moderator, a big believer in what did I hear the most of? Uh, when questions came in the door and it was equity, equity, equity. So I'm going to take kind of three or four questions and try to combine them into one to give all the panelists maybe something to sort of uh, latch on to. Uh, so again, it, it's going to feel like a compound question, but hopefully there, there, there's enough there for you to sort of figure out how you might want to orient uh, your response. 
Um, uh, so what are your recommendations for integrating equity into climate action? Um, very specifically, I think people are looking for uh, practical advice uh, related to sort of outreach strategy development uh, and implementation. So for instance, what steps are communities taking to ensure climate inequities are identified uh, on, on the front end of the conversation? What steps are taken to ensure that the needs of the most vulnerable communities uh, are prioritized uh, in the conversation about uh, action? And then a very sort of practical uh, question about sort of the engagement side of things. Um, any examples of providing stipends or other forms of compensation for partners that are engaging uh, in the work? So uh, fully recognize I gave you multiple questions rolled into one, but that's a pretty good summary of a, a, a few key equity uh, lines of inquiry that came in uh, through the various ways we collected questions. So any thoughts? Um, I can start if that's okay. I was just going to say that one thing that the city of Boulder is really reckoned with is um, kind of changing our approach to how we engage in climate action. And I think in the past, there's been kind of a, a process where we kind of sit in a room and put our heads down, we craft what we think is a good format moving forward, and then we go to council and we present our ideas. And I think that um, really engaging in um, the future and really incorporating equity into our process with our current climate mobilization action plan really just leans on community engagement and partnerships. Um, so we really have to recognize that we aren't always the experts in the community when it comes to certain areas and we really need to work with partners in the community um, to really give voice to the concerns that they have and to really speak to the issues that are at the forefront of their minds. And I think that's been kind of a really core element here is that we've really just have to work uh, really closely with community members to make sure that we're addressing equity and the concerns in a community in a really um, meaningful way, rather than um, us just kind of putting our own thoughts to what needs to happen. So I think that's been kind of a, a core change for us that has been really imperative in our, our climate action process. Um, I can hop in with a couple of best practices, Brad. Um, number one, I think that we find that the communities that are most successful in incorporating equity into their climate action plans are those that have long-term um, trusted relationships with community groups in their community. Um, if you try to start this um, you know, on January 1 and the climate action plan needs to come out July 1 and you're just now engaging community groups, um, it's not as impactful as, as having those very long standing, I mean, years and decades um, kinds of relationships. Um, so think about that. Also, I put a plug in for leading by example. We talked today about community scale climate action plans and sustainability plans, but often local governments will start with um, just a local government operations climate action plan. So looking at quantifying greenhouse gas emissions from your own fleet, your own buildings, your own procurement, and then thinking about ways that you can ensure um, an, an equitable uh, level, um, leveling up playing field in terms of the vendors, um, suppliers, and contractors that you're using to help you implement climate action um, through your local government operations um, strategies. And then that, of course, can um, also be um, scaled up to a community level. Yeah, and I just want to jump in and, and uh, echo that piece that Angie just brought up around building relationships. I think that really is the core integrating equity into climate action and really recognizing that it takes time to build that trust. And I think one of the things that has been really beneficial for us is to rather than our team necessarily always being the ones out in the community talking to folks and whatnot, although we have really, I think, built that capacity within our team, we really started from the place of building a strong partnership, as I mentioned, with our community services department, because those are the folks who are out in the community and who do have those decades long relationships with folks and who have spent a lot of time building that trust and really listening to them and really letting them sort of help lead the process of how do we go about that engagement? How do we talk to folks about sustainability and climate action? How do we understand how climate action really addresses 
um, specific needs that people have within the community that in a way that really resonates and connects with folks. And then really also understanding uh, engagement fatigue, because I think we are, there's, there's a big push now for different levels of community engagement. I think a lot of us across municipalities understand that our community engagement processes across the board, not just with climate action, have really been set up to perpetuate a lot of those inequities in the way that they've been structured and that we need to do things differently but also that we can't just keep going out to tap the same community members and say what do you think about this what do you think about this what do you think about this but really understanding a, a coordinated and having a more coordinated approach within your your organization of how you're going about that engagement why you're going about that engagement what kind of information are you looking for and then what's your level of accountability back to the community so it doesn't feel like a transactional process that it feels like a partnership that you're really building strategies that create a better community for everybody. Yeah, I would just echo <clears throat> everything that my fellow panelists have already talked about with the building relationships. I think um, where we're at in Wheat Ridge is kind of bringing the government into the community and then bringing the community you know into the government as well so um we have a neighborhood revitalization strategy where we're we have this listening tour and we're going into all the different neighborhoods in the city focusing on you know specific neighborhoods at a time and really just asking them questions bringing you know city staff to do virtual um town halls and things like that so that we can really hear from the community what is important to them so that we can kind of start to um, strategize on those types of things and then also you know bringing the community in, into the government with our equity task force and really um, allowing our, our residents to kind of have have that voice um, as they work through you know all the different city departments city um, codes and plans that we have so that we can really kind of bring bring that lens into everything that we do well, Kayla, that's actually a really good segue into a, a question that's, again, kind of a combo, uh, something that came in during registration, but also came in during uh, the presentations as well. Um, how can climate actions be folded into other activities that are that are happening, including sort of maybe transportation or a focus on health? Um, and, you know, in, in reality, sort of based on kind of the presentations today, is that sort of a strategy to kind of expand the reach of what probably is a small uh, shop of, of professionals locally that, that are working uh, on these topics. Is, is that a good strategy to, to think through in terms of bringing climate into more uh, conversations that are happening locally, maybe rather than just focusing on sort of climate and sustainability as its own uh, sort of cohort or bucket of activities? Thoughts on that? And if there's an easy sort of intersection that you've, you have found that like people understand the intersectionality or the connection between uh, issues that might be good to, to bring forward as well. Um, maybe I could talk uh, quickly about uh, hazard mitigation. Um, hazard mitigation plans are a, a common plan, obviously at the local government level. And um, we've been really working um, very diligently for the last couple of years to try to get some updated um, flood mapping um data from FEMA um, because a lot of the information um, that that cities are working with um, depending on what state you're in um, is dated and so if you're making decisions about development and not understanding that perhaps those uh, areas are in in harm's way in terms of um, future flooding for example um, that could be a really difficult um, decision to undo and so incorporating um, future climate impacts into your um, development processes is, I think, super important. And I'm sure my co-panelists have direct examples of how they've got to do that in their community. Yeah, I would just say that, um, I mean, climate is really uh, engaged in almost all aspects of our, our work in the city. It's like we have to address it through so many different areas and it really comes down to working with our partners um, and other departments to really incorporate climate planning into our land use plans, into our codes, into how we uh, interact with our ecosystems through our open space and mountain parks, with our parks and recreation departments, 
you know, there's so many ways that um, climate interse intersects with other action plans. So I think one of the, the things that we've been really working on is trying to engage with our other departments to make sure that we aren't missing out on their own kind of uh, planning mechanisms so that we are fully integrated into the work that they're doing as well. Um, and I think that that's really kind of what it, what it comes down to. We can't just kind of work as an island um, and push for our own sustainability measures. But really, climate action needs to be integrated into the work plans of all kind of different city departments so that everyone kind of has that, that focus in, in their minds of how they can kind of drive towards sustainable outcomes within their own scope of work. Yeah, to add on that, I, when we started our climate action planning process and our work with uh, the Climate Action Task Force, one of the things that we did was pull together, pull together an internal team from across the organization to just essentially audit what, what work is already being done. And there, as Lauren was talking about, there are so many areas that touch climate action. And I think one of the ways we've been able to get more support is to, is to really say, what's the work that you're doing and how can this focus on climate action help support and advance the work that you're doing uh, and help to provide additional resources or leverage resources across the organization. And I think that that um, has been really beneficial, again, so that we aren't just our own island or that we aren't trying to go off and create something that that is uh, contrary or making things difficult for somebody in another part of our organization. I'd love to do one more question that came in. It was actually kind of inspired by polling, but it's going to be kind of lightning round, rapid fire. Uh, so this has only got like two minutes left. Uh, in one of the polls, someone sort of responded like the importance of easy wins, air quotes here, easy wins. Any thoughts on programs and actions where community members can see their impact? Are there examples that come to mind that are just kind of like low hanging fruit type things that build energy and momentum uh, locally around this topic? Sustainable neighborhoods. <laughs> it's great. Um, the residents are in charge. They, you know, develop their plan. They plan and execute and implement and manage everything. And it's it's really high visibility. And it's something that you know both city staff and our community can feel really great about. I'd say yes at an individual level, like uh, advocating for policy change um, is really kind of a core element. We need everyone kind of on board advocating for change at, at a larger level than what can kind of even just be done um, individually. I guess I would say, of course, individual choices and actions matter. But I think collectively, if we all drive towards uh, policy changes, both in our local governments and at the state level, um, we can create so much more effective action at the larger scale. So I think that's kind of a really core element um, that that could have a lo lot of impact. Yeah. Yeah, and I would I would just add, although uh, quick wins and low hanging fruit, it's not quite as straightforward as that. But I would definitely say, you know, just uh, don't recreate the wheel. There's a ton of information already out there that other folks are already doing that that I think it's really important to learn from. And then again, to continue these types of effort to look at at regional and statewide collaboration that help move our local work forward. I'm gonna say identify your local and internal champions um, because they, they wanna do this work. And if you can figure out who they are, they will work very hard um, to help you be successful. Perfect, thank you. Thank you all again. Uh, Kate said she needed about 60 seconds to do wrap up. So we'll do wrap up real quick. Uh, but I'd be remiss if we didn't all give Kate uh, uh, a big thanks for getting us organized and and allowing this to be as seamless as, as possible and supporting all the speakers and the panelists. So thank you, Kate, for uh, keeping us on track. With that I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Brad. And um, I failed to introduce you before, but Brad is our division director in regional planning and development here at Dr. Cog. Um, really appreciate you all joining live today and engaging in this conversation. Um, we are looking at ways to invite dynamic conversations around important topics affecting our region, so we really appreciate all your participation. Um, a huge thanks to all of our panelists for their time and energy to thoughtfully put together an engaging presentation. Um, please note that when the webinar closes, a pop-up will appear. This is a survey that lets us know what is working, what we can do better, and what topics you might want to see in the future. Um, so thanks again, and hope you all have a wonderful day.